to do a selfie where we can yeah, see all of you guys. All right, everybody, say hi, wave. <laughs> you tweeted at me? <laughs> nice to see you. Wow. This is like Starship Troopers. <laughs> There's so many people here. There are so many women here. It's and amazing. It's great to be here, guys. Thank you for having me. So, Mindy, the title of our panel is Feminism 2.0. So I guess my first question to you is, do we have any idea what exactly Feminism 2.0 is? Um, I think. I don't, you know, I'm, when I ask, if, when people ask me if I'm a feminist, the answer is always yes. But I never take my definition of feminism and line it up against other people's feminism because almost always there'll be so many differences. So here's what it means to me in feminism 2.0. Um, equal pay, um, uh, equal opportunities. Um, it means to me something as basic as um, believing in reproductive freedom. Um, thank you. Uh, and um, to me, it means being able to have, feel safe in, in an environment where you can, you feel safe speaking up about something. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always a little surprised when I find that people are scared of the word. Mm -hmm. I think that the connotations of feminist, although I do think this is fading now, have um, connotations of like, not femininity, mm -hmm. and I think, uh, I think that's changing because I think it's a shame. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that, that actually leads to, and right on to your definition of feminism, by the way, it's fantastic. Um, that leads to something that I think is a thread through so many of the characters that you've played, which is that you, know, you yourself are, you're an intellectual, you're a student of Latin, you're a reader, but you're also somebody who loves fashion, loves beauty, and um, clearly believes that both of these things can coexist in a woman's brain and, and life. Do you, do you think the understanding of what a woman can be is expanding? Absolutely. And it always makes me sad when I think, because I think a lot of people, um, I think especially men, but also women, sometimes think that you can't be interested in things like fashion or things that are traditionally feminine and also be a strong woman. And I face this all the time because my character on my show is really obsessed with that. And me personally, loves looking at fashion magazines, I love makeup. And I think the reason is because there's some suspicion that if you are interested in that, that means you're doing it for a man. Mm. That you're doing it for the attention of a man to catch a man or for something that would be um, in any way sort of uh, against women or you have some weird ulterior motive. And I think that that is, at least for me, incorrect. I do it because, I, I mean, I'm like probably some of you, I feel like if anything, I dress for other women. Mm -hmm. And I find it such a great expressive art. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing a canary yellow dress because I thought this is an environment that would be able to appreciate it. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> I, um, I wish that we didn't inextricably link being interested in those things and being a strong woman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I am, I think, unabashedly a feminine feminist. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, there's a lot of us out there that are worried that it makes us somehow impure. And I, I would like to say that I disagree with that. So. Um, I want to talk about your own career path. And you have a chapter in your first book, which was called well, the book is, Is Everyone Hanging Out Without Me? I'm sure you all have read it. If not, get on that. It's amazing. Um, there's a chapter called Failing at Everything in the Greatest City on Earth, which was about your experiences trying to get hired in New York. So can you tell us about a few key early Mindy Kaling failures? Sure. And as a, just a little side note about failure. There is a part of me, too, that just wants to appear to this group of thousands of women and just be like, I was always successful. I never had a misstep my whole life. <laughs> so you think that I was just some wonderkin. But the truth is, um, I've had so much heartbreak and so much, so much door slamming in my face to get to where I am now. And the experience that I think most encapsulates this, and only now, over 10 years later, can I look back at that, is when I was 24 and uh, I had just written a, written a play in New York City with my best friend. I moved from New York to LA and I wrote a pilot, which is the first episode of a TV series called Mindy and Brenda, that was uh, autobiographical about my friend Brenda and me. 
and it took place in Brooklyn. The characters were utterly based on us. We had the same names, and we acted the same way. And when we went in LA, we were lucky enough to have the pilot picked up to, to actually be shooting it. And I was told that I had to audition for the part of Mindy, <laughs> the part I had created for myself. And um, I had that inflated sense of confidence that people in their early 20s have. And I thought, oh, this will be fine. I, I'm funny. I know the part. I know it can nail it. And what I realized was the reason that they didn't want us to play. We, we had won awards in New York for playing the uh, a, a play together was that um, we didn't look like what they wanted for a television show. And this is for a network, the WB, which no longer exists, which makes me feel fantastic. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I can also now talk about it a little more freely. So I had to go through the heartbreaking experience of sitting in a room with other much thinner, much more traditionally attractive young women. And so I was forced, I was sort of pitted against other women who were reading for my part. And because at that time, I mean, this was 2004, 2003, so the era was very different. There was not this active search for minority actresses. So after searching half-heartedly for about a week or two, the producers then opened it up to all races. So I was sitting in the room with these beautiful young blonde actresses, 18, 19 years old, who were auditioning for the role of Mindy Kaling. When you look at it now, it's like the, the idea of it's that. It's like a joke. It's I like mean, a joke. It's a scene out of a bad movie. Which is kind of, which is, I think, really reassuring because that was not like, you know, it wasn't like in 1972, it was in the early 2000s. And so it's amazing how quickly things can change. But um, that experience almost made me want to quit the business. I mean, to have to call my parents every day and, and they're like, did you get cast as Mindy? And I'm like, I think I'm getting close. I think the audition went well. And it was like a, so. It's Kafka-esque, actually. It's, it was. Um, at the time, I mean, I've heard you talk about this before, and I, and I always wondered what the people around you, other than, other than your parents, but your agents and managers were saying to you at the time. Did anybody encourage you to sort of fight back against it? You know, the, one of the tragic things about success is that as you get more successful, people tell you to fight. But the times when you need to is when you're younger and you have no leverage. So my agent at the time told me to go on a juice cleanse. And at the time, I thought, OK, sure. So I remember I did a juice cleanse, to, so, as though that would have helped yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, you were just one juice cleanse away from playing it, it One juice cleanse away. And you sort of get caught in that kind of thinking. I mean, I still do stuff like that now. Um, and I remember her saying, like, won't you just feel so much better if you could just lose 20 pounds? And she's no longer my agent either. But um, <laughs> She's hanging out with the WB? She's, she's, she's <laughs> yes. And I, I just felt like, in her point of view, she was just trying to help me and position me in a place where I would face less heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And so when your own advocates are telling you advice that is that toxic, it's, it's pretty hard. You know, so I, I always like to tell that story because even without that, I remember I got cast on a on a on a show called The Office at the time, which was at NBC and considered to be the lowest of the of the of the rung of their priorities, like the show that they didn't think would last. It was a remake of a little seen British show, and so, but on that show, my boss did not care how I looked. It was all just about real people, and that was what was considered beautiful, and. I also learned a lot from that experience. So luckily, that trumped this first horrible one. I what, had. We'll move on from this first horrible experience yes. in just one minute. But what would you say to a young woman out there in the audience who is maybe in a similar position where she's not at an incredibly powerful point in her career yet? So people aren't telling her fight back, and mm -hmm. she feels like she's in a position that isn't great for her. So she's 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 you back in 2004. So I have I have noticed that um, I have gotten a lot more, I'm a very fiery personality, I have a lot of opinions. Um, I think my mind is one that no matter what experience I'm in, whether it's at work or at a home relationship or a boyfriend, if I see injustice, I feel like I need to say it. What I have learned is that it is so much more valuable to notice injustice and to write it down and to remember it because it becomes a powerful tool and I think that Unfortunately, especially if you're a young woman who's working in an environment where you don't have as much job security, if you become 
outspoken to the wrong people, there is not a lot of protection for you. But I have I found that by knowing what my obstacles were and making note of it, and I could I could be crafty and I could strategize. And I think that my entire career has has been built on noticing things and and like and keeping like a long list of like I'm now sounding like a lunatic a little bit. But <laughs> I want to read that list. <laughs> I know. Well it's it's like, you know, we are often we're we're often told that we need to speak out, but I have noticed there's a great deal of value in just being very perceptive without being expressive, mm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. When you talked about joining the office, you were, you know, even though you had the, these writing credits under your belt, you were still 24. You know, that's very young to be in the writer's room, and you were the only woman on a writing staff of eight. Mm -hmm. So how did you have your voice be heard? What, what strategies did you use to sort of speak up in those circumstances? Or didn't you have to think that way? Well, I was, I was lucky because my, my boss on the show, Greg Daniels, is, was, you know, when you think of that statistic, it seems very dire. And believe me, there are shows on TV, in fact, probably a majority of shows on TV where the environment for women is very hostile. At the office, Greg's aesthetic was, he wanted it to be very diverse, very real, and he hired me because he was actively seeking a different voice. So I was encouraged to speak up, and I was surrounded by men who were uh, encouraging of that as well, and I think that that helped it. I think for me, it was getting over, I didn't, if you ask anyone on that show, I didn't speak for pretty much the first month, which became um, good because I kind of was taking in my environment before I let anyone know how I felt about things. And that, again, was very useful mm. um, to just be, <laughs> to just observe. You were taking your notes. I was taking my notes. You were taking your notes. Um, you've talked a lot about hard work. And one of the things that I, I love is that you're a defender of it. That mm -hmm. sometimes in America, you know, no one wants to look like they're a workaholic. And of course, we all want work-life balance. But you're very open about saying that hard work is what has gotten you where you are. Can you defend workaholism to us a little bit? I Not can. that I'm personally invested in the answer to this question. I can, and I can also just say that uh, it is easier for me. I, I want to put the disclaimer out there. I, I don't have kids. And I think that when you have children, when you are married, that is, um, that is when you have to start making much more harder decisions. But my feeling is that I'm the child of immigrants. And I think that hard work is the great equalizer. I didn't come from, you know, I didn't have family that was in the business. I grew up in Boston, and I, my parents, my, the only connections I had to it were, uh, the only thing I had going for me was hard work, and my parents sort of believed in the, the old, you know, why this country was great, is that you can, through hard work, like break barriers. And so that is sort of was instilled in me as a young person. Mm -hmm. Now I have a slightly more, I think a slightly more sophisticated view of it, which is that hard work can get you to a place, and then um, you need to be working for someone who is going to be open-minded. You need to be working in a fair environment. But when I was young, it was the only way. Mm -hmm. So that that's why I am so attached to that idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to talk about the Mindy Project a little bit. And when we honored you as a Glamour Woman of the Year two years ago, you said that it was really important to you on the Mindy Project that there be a number of women writers mm -hmm. and that the, the writing room not feel like, you know, what so many do on TV. Why, other than basic equity, was that important to you? You know, I think, honestly, the only way that we can, if I'm going to say that I'm a feminist, the only way that I am able to sort of put my money where my mouth is, is by being an employer who employs women. And I think it's not only writers, but directors. I mean, right now there's going to be class action lawsuits against mm -hmm. studios for not being inclusive of women. And I think that um, TV is such a great opportunity for women because it's, you know, a 30 minute episode of television. It's not like a movie. The Everything is a little bit less expensive than movies. So you can test out a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And this year we've had um, so many wonderful directors and writers, Gita Patel, Misha Ganatra, Linda Mendoza, women who are incredibly funny. Um, those women happen to also be minorities who are just looking for an outlet. Mm -hmm. And they're hard to find sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's often the excuse I think employers give of why they don't have any is that they couldn't find them. And so I think that what I've, 
as much as I am busy, it's just deciding as an employer that you are going to just take the time to do that instead of the same time to do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, you recently told the New York Times that you actually had come up through the NBC diversity program, mm -hmm. although you say you didn't know at the time that you were in it. Yes. <laughs> what, what makes a program like that successful when it is? So, the NBC diversity program was kind of wonderful because it was very stealth. I never signed up to be in a diversity program. NBC just identified me correctly as a minority. And <laughs> first uh, step. First step. And without telling me, which I thought was great, I didn't have to attend a seminar or take time to do anything, um, told Greg Daniels that uh, if you, the program worked this way, which is if they hired a, a person of color, um, that the NBC would pay for my salary for the first year. And then after that, if the showrunner liked me, they would continue to pay for my salary. And what I loved about that was that um, no one else knew about it. Mm -hmm. It gave uh, an economic advantage for someone in power so they could use that money for something else. Mm -hmm. And it worked out great. Mm -hmm. And I know that that kind of program comes under fire a lot. And I think that there's a lot of writers who fear being like, you know, in, in any of these programs of being like a, a person of color, a person who's only hired because of that. But I owe so much to it. Mm -hmm. And um, not, not every network does that, but I will always be very grateful. And uh, I think that program was great. Mm -hmm. Um, back to the Mindy Project. On the set of the Mindy Project, you're very much the boss. And I think one thing that a lot of young women struggle with when they get to their first position where they're really the one in charge is that you have to let go, at least some of the time, of that desire to be liked mm -hmm. by everybody that, uh, that I think many of us experience. Was that an issue for you? And how did you, how did you deal with that, if it were? It was an issue for me, and it's something that I think about a lot, this idea of being likable. And I think, uh, I remember uh, one time we had a guest star come on the show, and uh, she said to me, Mindy, you're so sweet. And one of my co-stars jokingly said, oh no, sweetness left her long ago. <laughs> and I laughed, I laughed because I thought it was funny, and then I thought about it all my ride home, and it was <laughs> keeping me up at night. And the reason it was keeping me up at night is because I think that he was right. And I thought, oh my God, I had an instant panic of like, oh God, am I not sweet anymore? What does that mean? Is that something, is that some uh, insult to my, again, my femininity? Because you know, I'm a vain actress, I want everyone to love me. And what I realized was I am not sweet anymore. And I also realized that I don't care. Because when I think about people who are powerful, for women who are powerful, for people who affect change, make decisions, real leaders, real bosses, the people that I look up to, I would not think that any one of them would be described as sweet mm -hmm. by the people who work for them because you can't. And I think that sweetness, if you think about it, if women think about it, is an adjective that we don't like. We use it when we talk about women and we don't like them. If you say, what did you think of Donna? Oh, she was sweet. <laughs> Sweet is an adjective that men like and women don't. And I, it made me realize that, that um, I'm like, the connotations of it for women are kind of dumb, uh, unimpressive, a little bit weak or agreeable. And then I went in the next day and said, you know what, I don't need to be sweet. I'd rather be rich. I'd rather be, and so I felt, you know, and then, you know, of course, like kindness is of course very important, but I think that's separate. But um, I, I do, I did used to worry about that, and now, now I've decided, if any of you guys are worried about it, when you get to a position of, uh, where you're making decisions or you have employees, I hope that you too can discard it the way that I have. Because so. you'd rather be rich than sweet. <laughs> Let's all go needlepoint that on pillows. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the Mindy Project itself, and mm -hmm. the mid-season uh, premiere was last week, so. Uh, am I allowed to discuss spoilers? Oh, please. Do we think? Okay, so spoiler alert to anybody who hasn't seen it yet, but can you tell us a little bit about the decision to break up Danny and Mindy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> it's been on the air for like about a week and a half, you guys. <laughs> Get on it. Um, yeah, so uh, Cindy, what you're talking about, and for those of you who haven't seen my show, is that my character, who is very different than me, very funny, but very flawed, uh, who is kind of obsessed with marriage and settling down with the, with the right guy. 
uh, I think she's literally said, I can't wait till I can find a man and dump all of my friends. <laughs> so very, very strange but funny comedy character. She finally had, at the end of last season, uh, found the kind of the guy of her dreams and the guy of her dreams that the show has positioned. The wonderfully talented and wonderful person, Chris Messina, who plays Danny on the show. And uh, they have a, a baby together. And this past couple, uh, this past week, uh, after months of fighting over uh, some issues about her work, they, I, the characters broke out. And I think it was something, believe me, many people have had issues with it, very divisive, even with my friends. And I think that um, what I was interested in doing is you know what the, the concept of the marriage plot is, mm -hmm. right? So the marriage plot is in a lot of Jane Austen novels uh, or in even just any romance novels where the end of the book is when a couple gets together. And movies often have this as an, uh, as an end point. And what I was interested in is the thing you don't see that often, which is what happens after a couple gets together, especially if they're opposites the way that my character was and with, with Danny. And this, these were two people who were very strong-minded, strong-willed, and he didn't want her to work as much as she was working, and she was starting a new business. And as someone who is ambitious, and I'm just gonna assume that most of you are if you're here as well, that doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And my friends who have children, uh, if anything, their ambition gets sharpened as they have children, because they wanna be a role model, they wanna be a breadwinner, and they feel even more driven to be uh, something that their children can be proud of as well. And I thought, okay, let's like live the truth of both these characters and what would that mean for them? And unfortunately, it meant, in my opinion, breaking them up. Now, that's not to say that we have seen the last of them as a couple. I think the chemistry I have with him as an actor is fantastic. We love working together and um, he's definitely gonna be in the world because they co-parent. So I just went, that was a deep cut for the show. No. For those of you who haven't seen it, you were like, what is she talking about? Why is she telling us this for an hour and a half? But I do like talking about it because it was, I got a lot of well, feedback about well, it. Well, there's a lot of layers there. And I think actually that is a very, if I may, feminist decision to flip the marriage plot like that and decide not to do the conventional thing. We, this character is obsessed with wearing a wedding gown and walking down an aisle. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I need to refuse to give that to her. <laughs> You're a sadist. <laughs> because I don't wanna see a show, I mean, life is hard. Life is hard for everybody. There's not a single person here, I think, who wouldn't say, my life is a challenge. You, you can be happy, you can be someone who's depressed, you can be someone who's cheerful, but if you look at your life, it is hard. And I think that our shows, while being funny and entertaining and teaching us, need to reflect that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, if I wanna, you know, just watch a show that is going to transport me to a different, I'll, I'll watch a Kardashian show. God knows, that's why I have a treadmill, <laughs> right? It's to just, it's to watch that, to look at their bodies and go, that looks fun to have that. <laughs> There's a place for it, right? <laughs> that lifestyle looks interesting to me. Her taupe one pieces, bodycon leotards, whatever she's wearing that I would never wear, I love it. But for what I wanna do as an artist, I wanna have a show that life can be hard uh, even when what you want is like within your grasp, mm -hmm. so. H has it been different this season to be on Hulu? How has that felt? It has been different and it, actually causes me a lot of sadness because I worked on network television for 13 years and made art through that system of executives and notes. And to see what it's like to work at Hulu and how much easier it is was um, a little depressing, easier, I say. Easier in what ways? Easier in that it's the difference between, you know, when you are working in 30 Rock or you're in Burbank at the NBC building, you feel like you're part of an old tradition and that has such a great feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and you feel like you're part of a system. And I think a lot of us crave to make our way in something that's very established. It makes us feel like we've accomplished something. And that's very much what it felt like to go through that system. And I still, uh, NBC Studios still produces my show. And with Hulu, it's like being part of a startup where there is no past. And if anyone is going to make it great, it's gonna be me. And so that's a very different feeling than being on you know, a network that had a bunch of great shows. But I will tell you, the artistic freedom I feel to not have to be compared to anything else and mm. to not have the same kind of test groups, 
to not be part of the system that would not cast me as my own self mm. um, is great. And um, they really believe in me as an artist. Plus, we can say, like, tits deep up in a margarita, which is like kind of fun to say sometimes. <laughs> so I get, we get a little bit more freedom in the way that we talk <laughs> and sex scenes and things like that. Um, the, we talked about your first book, but your second book has the wonderful title of Why Not Me? Can you tell us a little bit about that phrase and, and what it means to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Why Not Me meant two things. The first is the, um, was the sort of the clearer version of Why Not Me, which was that I, as I said, and as you can glean from, from the me in the past, is I'm a very ambitious person. And unlike a lot of my friends, when I was growing up and watched TV, virtually no one looked like me. And it was never a given that I would ever see my own self reflected in the things that I watched. But I've noticed, even in the, in the past 10 years, you know, if you told me that Melissa McCarthy would be the most reliable female film star mm -hmm. in the country, 10 years ago, I would have been amazed. So I always knew that there's going to be change. And I can either wait and let somebody else do it and hope to be helped by them, or I can just do it or try to do it myself. And I think my impatience kind of beat out my hope that someone else would do it. And so Why Not Me, I think, is, um, is the name for that kind of urgent, impatient feeling, I think, of being like, OK, well, if I want what I want, then I have to be a pioneer. Mm -hmm. I will say that there are many times when I'm saying, like, this is exhausting. I wish I didn't have to. It doesn't mean that I have wanted to, but I have felt that that's been how I've gotten where I've gotten. The second um, meaning of Why Not Me to me is that I, many of my friends, I'm 36, are married. They have kids. They, uh, you know, they have a lot of the sort of traditional family events that I long for so much and have really put up on a pedestal. You know, you don't love romantic comedies as much as I do without, without thinking about those things and, and really romanticizing family and what that must be like. And so the other meaning of why not me is, like, why not me? Like, why have I not been chosen to participate in the great tradition of motherhood and wifehood? And I talk a little bit about that in my book um, with like real, you know, both like hope, um, anxiety, wistfulness, and um, I've, it's been nice though because I've noticed that since the book has come out, I can meet so many other women who have that same feeling of the hopefulness that that will will happen. So it's interesting as you're saying that I'm just struck by how unusual it actually is to hear somebody in the public eye say what you just said, which is a very human thing that I think so many of us relate to, but there's you know, generally this sort of stock line that comes out of like, I'm all good, I'm fine, I'm happy exactly where I am. Mm -hmm. um, do you find a power in, in just being honest about what you're feeling? Well, I am like a naturally very happy person. I have the most fun job. I have a, a great, exciting dating life, and I, I enjoy lots of those things, but I think it's, I think you're right. I think that people want to project, especially if you want to be like a role model, a sense of that everything is fine, um, like R-E-S-P-E-C-T, <laughs> like I have my glass of wine and my best girlfriends, which by the way, I do, I do have and I love. But um, yeah, I think it's okay to strive. I think it's okay to have your, your list of what you hope you want to constantly be evolving. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I, I, my mom was, my relationship with my mother was, you know, I've said this before, she was my soulmate, she was my best friend. It's the single most impactful relationship that I've had in my life. And now that she's gone, my only hope is to be able to kind of replicate it downwards, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, then now I guess I have to be the mom. So yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I hope that happens. Yeah. <laughs> I think it'll happen. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, I think the way you talk about your mother and her influences is really beautiful in, in the book. Thank you. Um, let's talk about giving some words of potentially motherly wisdom to some of the young women who are in the audience. You know, you, you have this, this confidence that you say you, you, know, you kind of um, have always had on some level. What should a young woman who is trying to get some place in her career and in her life and doesn't have that bulletproof sense of confidence just yet. What's your counsel to her? 
It's such a good question, and I've written about this a lot, and I think about it a lot, because, you know, I have no statistical proof that any of my advice has worked on anyone. I can only <laughs> hope that it it has, and you know. Well, we're in Silicon Valley. Yes. We're close to it, so somebody out there do that study and that, an <laughs> that analyzing. Would, that would be great. I would find that I would love to. I would love to learn from that. Um, but I think about young women so much of the time, and I think a lot of the reason is because they have helped me so much, and they care about me so much, and what my choices are. And um, I have two, two things about, um, one thing about confidence, and one thing about uh, what just general advice. And the one thing I'll say to young women is that, and young people in general, actually, but since you're all women, I'll just focus on you. I'd like to phase out the, the sort of term or the email uh, sentence that you write in an email, which is, I'd love to take you out to coffee and pick your brain. I have received that many, many times as someone in, in my business, and, I, and I'm sure as a young person, you probably have sent that email. And the reason I, I want to phase that out is that I think that the thinking that goes behind that is not helpful to you. And here's why. When you want advice or you're looking for a mentor, you have to put yourself into the position of the person whose job you want. And this is, I'm just trying to give like strategic advice to young women. And I think that often when you say, I'd like to take you out and pick your brain, you're thinking about how this person can help you and how this person who you may or may not know or want, like how they can give you advice. And I think the smarter way and the way that you're gonna get what you want is if you, if you think of like, how am I going to help them? Because you know, everyone is just trying to do their own thing. They're, everyone's just trying to succeed in their own way. And I'll tell you, if I got an email from someone that said, I think what you do is amazing, and I would love to help you do that, I would feel so flattered, surprised, and excited to meet them. And the way that I learned from my mentor at the office, Greg, was I never, the wisest things I learned from him were not sitting over a cup of coffee, having him tell me about his life. I can learn that online. It was watching him and helping him with his job. And I don't know if you feel this way too, but I, I found that that, if, if I could just help younger women with, with how to get what they want, I think that they would actually learn a lot from that. Mm. Um, and in terms of just confidence, uh, which I've, I've written about, uh, I actually wrote an essay in my book about this. It was uh, about a young girl who was like 15 or 16 who saw me at an event in New York City. And she said to me, uh, I want to know how I can get back my confidence because I used to have some and now I, I don't. And at the time I gave her n not a great answer, but I think that the, the sort of the short version of that is that um, all of, everything I have in my life has come from two things. Doing it myself, I had to create my own show. No one would have ever created the show for me. And the other thing was turning a blind eye to partying, um, networking through network events and all those things and just working hard. And it sounds like it's so uh, simple and easy, but it's literally the only, the only way that I've gotten to where I've gotten is ignoring everything else. So I, I hope that's somewhat helpful. That's incredibly helpful. Okay. Mindy, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, much. of course. Yeah, my and, pleasure. And thanks to all of you. Thanks. That was so great. <laughs> thank you.